Hello, Mike. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining with us for this latest edition of Bible Bases Broken Bread Bible Study Series. And we're in the middle, <laughs> hopefully far, far longer than the middle, far past the middle of the series, which is we're calling The Better Covenant Revisited. I won't reintroduce that again. You will have heard it ad nauseum, I would think. But this is study number 59. And my title for this one is A New Dynamic. So, introduction. So, we've seen the way in which the new covenant, new birth, entrance into the kingdom of God, the coming of the Spirit, are different expressions used to describe what is essentially the same event, full initiation into the person of Jesus Christ. The process whereby a man or a woman becomes joined in spirit with Christ himself to create a new man, which can be described as I in you and you in me. And it's time to look at the way the scriptures explain the means whereby this miracle of the spirit takes place. To do so, we shall have to revisit some of those ancient prophecies and say how they are interpreted in the New Testament. Curing the incurable. The promise of the New Covenant. How often have we been back to these verses? We are indebted to Jeremiah for this first use of the term New Covenant. The book of Jeremiah is a series of prophecies given over quite a period of time, but we can identify common themes and threads. Our starting point for this series of Bible meditation studies has been Jeremiah 31, verse 31 following. Nice and easy to remember. Jeremiah 31, 31. I'm going to read 31 to 33. Behold, and I'm reading from the American Standard Version, that's the 1900 one, because it uses the word Jehovah, which I think is really valuable here. Behold, the days come, says Jehovah, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now let me pause for a moment. You see, Jehovah, that's the name by which God introduced himself to the people who came out of Egypt and who were joined with him in a covenant at Sinai and became... Israel, God's Israel, or sometimes it refers to God himself as Jehovah, Israel's God. He would be identified with them, and they would be identified with him in a unique relationship. And all these years farther on now, Jeremiah says, Behold, the days come, says Jehovah, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah. Just another reminder that when the scriptures kind of at this point in time, when they specify something like this, the house of Judah and the house of Israel, they're reminding us that at this point in Jeremiah's life and in Jeremiah's ministry, the people of God had become split into two quite separate kingdoms with their own monarchies, their own directions, their own destinies. But now God speaks to both of them. The house of Israel, that's the northern kingdom in of Israel, Samaria, it's called Ephraim, it's called, got several different names, and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by their hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So, as we've said so frequently, the first thing that Jeremiah tells us about the New Covenant, and it's not to be ignored, it's to be made much of, in my opinion. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. In other words, the very first thing that God did to describe this New Covenant that he was going to make with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah is that it would not be like the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them from by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Now that is so clearly 
specified as regards the event and the location that we know instantly. We're talking about the Sinai covenant, which my covenant, it goes on to say, they break. Although I was a husband to them, says Jehovah. We've said this before, but Jehovah entered into a covenant with them, which was akin to a marriage. And they became the bride of Jehovah. They became God's unique people under his headship. And here he says, my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, says Jehovah. And then having said so clearly that this covenant is not going to be like the covenant that he made with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, says Jehovah. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Now, if you go back into our studies, you'll see why I've um, indicated why now we don't have a covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. We have a covenant with a united house of Israel. This is the covenant that I make with the house of Israel. After those days, says Jehovah, I will put my law in their inward parts. In the old covenant that he made with Israel, he had his laws inscribed in stone and copied out on parchments which were kept together in the tabernacle. But here he says, I will put my law in their inward parts and in their heart will I write it. Not now written with the finger of God on tablets of stone, but I will write it in their heart and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, at first glance, they, this may seem confusing because you might say, well, aren't they already God's people? Didn't the Sinai covenant make them God's people? Yes, it did. And the Sinai covenant was always intended to be additional and temporary. It was, it was given because of transgressions until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. That is to say, until the time of the Christ. So that covenant has reached its sell-by date. It's reached its good until date. So there comes a point at which it will no longer be operable. It will no longer be in power. And he says, I'll put my Lord in their inward parts, and in their heart will I write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Coming back to that ultimate purpose of God in bringing these people, that they would be his and he would be theirs. You know, marriage is an exclusive relationship. It excludes everybody else. In the old Anglican service, they would say, and keeping the only to himself as long as you both shall live. Something like that, anyway. So it was an exclusive. Now, the Sinai covenant was an exclusive one. The people had broken it, and now God says he's going to make a new one. And this new one will not be written on tables of stone but it will be written in their hearts and as a consequence of that they will be mine and i will be theirs or as the scripture says it i will be their god and they shall be my people that's marriage two people coming together there's much more than this but this will remember remind us of our starting point and we can make two broad points about these verse they make it clear, <laughs> I hope I've made it clear, that the new covenant is different to the old covenant. And secondly, this contains God's promises to internalize his mind and will into those who entered into that new covenant. This was never promised in the old covenant. There they had the law of the testimony. They had the testimony in the Ark of the Covenant, God's commitment to them, and they had the version which was written by Moses for the people of Israel themselves. So the two copies of this contract were side by side in the holy place of the tabernacle. So that was all external. But now God promises to internalize his mind and will in those who enter into that new covenant. The way that Jeremiah describes it is in terms of heart and mind. Now, uh, we won't try to define these time terms precisely at this point, because I think that would be a distraction that would 
take yourself in a big loop. But just make the comment that these terms have to do with the innermost aspect of our humanity. To get to the heart of the matter is to get to the very centre of the issue. This predicted new covenant is going to get to the heart of the matter. God is going to put his revealed will into the inner man. He will write it plainly in the inner consciousness of men and women, and the consequence of this will be that God will be the God of this new covenant people, and this new covenant people will belong exclusively to God. Quite distinct from the Sinai covenant. The heart. This is not the first time that Jeremiah speaks of things written on the heart. And if we look at his early use, it'll give us some pointers as to what he is saying, because he's already, in his prophecies, he's already established a way of expressing something. So for this, we need to turn to one of the most used Old Testament texts in older evangelical preaching, I would think. Maybe you had to learn this at Sunday school. Jeremiah 17, earlier. Verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things, and it is exceedingly corrupt. Who can know it? Generations of Sunday school children have probably committed it to heart, but what does it mean? Well, the original Hebrew declares the heart is crooked above all things, and incurable. Who can know it? The phrase points to a depth of crookedness in the heart that is far beyond human comprehension and which is incurable. What is this disease that God is identifying? Yes, he's speaking to the people of the house of Israel and the house of Judah. But he's speaking to the nation and he's speaking to those who will be members, constituent parts of this new covenant. So what is this disease? And how do you treat something that is incurable? Indelible sin. At the beginning of this same chapter, chapter 17, Jeremiah describes the behavior of the house of Judah. You remember? The house of Israel had been taken into captivity in Assyria, and the house of Judah at this time, Jeremiah was about to suffer the same fate and be taken captive to Babylon. Jeremiah, now in 17 verse 1, describes the heart condition of the southern kingdom and declares, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. With the point of a diamond, it is engraved on the tablet of their heart. A pen of iron, of course, is a chisel. Judah's sin was carved indelibly into its innermost being. Judah's sin is not something that lay superficially on the surface, not something that can be treated cosmetically with a coat of paint. Their sin had become permanently etched into their inner man. And you'll see now why later Jeremiah declares that their condition is incurable. The law of God had been carved into tablets of stone on Sinai, his will permanently expressed and unalterable. Now Jeremiah says the nation's disposition is carved into their hearts, permanently expressed and uncurable. So what is he talking about? How shall we, what are the symptoms that we can recognize as to what he's speaking? How shall we diagnose Judah's condition and identify the disease? Well, this 17th chapter of Jeremiah describes the condition graphically. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the tablet of their heart and upon the horns of your altars. You see, this is endemic. This, this isn't just on the lives of individuals, but this has gone into the very nation itself. It, it's not just touched their laws as individuals, but it's touched their altars, their inner life, their place of 
relinquishing of the right to themselves and the giving of themselves to God. It graven upon the tablet of their heart and upon the horns of your altars, while their children remember their altars and their Asherim, that's the plural of Ashtote, basically. These are, these are gods identified with the stars by the green trees upon the high hills in the groves where the people of Judah were now performing their sacrifices to the host of heaven, performing sacrifices that bound them in covenants to a whole host of other gods. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the tablet of their heart. You see, you're not going to wash this off. Graven upon the tablet of their heart and upon the horns of your altars, whilst their children remember their altars and their asherim by the green trees, these, these religious groves upon the high hills. These words describe a proneness to idolatry that was relentless. This is the way Israel, the northern kingdom, had gone. They so perverted what you might call, what shall we call it, the, the relationship, scholars will call this Yahwism. That's the official way they reckon that we should pronounce the word that I keep on pronouncing as Jehovah. And what they were really saying is that in those days of the northern kingdom, Yahwism became a pagan cult. It identified Yahweh with other gods, with other names. It began to engage in hideous rituals, um, spiritual, physical immorality, promiscuity. Their sin really, it, it, well, it was relentless. The words describe a proneness to idolatry that was relentless. I've just been reading in my own Bible times the story of Solomon. It is tragic. Tragic. And you see David, the epitome, I know he had his failures, but the epitome of what might have been the monarchy of someone who was ruling as king, conscious of the fact that he was God's leader in order to serve the people. But even in David's life, we see signs of David taking something of a high and mighty attitude and be beginning to behave like Oriental kings and having people killed just to further his own lustful desires, all kinds of things. The words here in Jeremiah are describing a proneness to idolatry that is relentless. Their sin is spiritual promiscuity. They constantly seek for other gods. They are insatiable. They have become addicted to false gods and false religion. And at the heart of all idolatry is a refusal to, to, to surrender to the true God. It tells us that, Paul tells us that in Romans chapter 1. But it's because they did not give God his glory and they did not give thanks to God that God gave them over. It was because they rejected revelation that ultimately they were sucked into this mire of idolatry. They become addicted to false gods and false religion. The heart of all idolatry is a refusal to surrender to the true God and to be true to the revelation that he has given to us. Now, the Bible is, is a down-to-earth book in many ways, and Jeremiah's language is certainly down-to-earth and downright earthy at times. He had described symptoms of this disease earlier in Jeremiah 2 and verse 24. He says, For of old time I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bonds, and thou saidst, he's speaking to the nation of Judah, Thou hast said, I will not serve. For upon every high hill and under every green tree you bowed yourself down, playing the harlot. You see, they entered into a covenant with God which was effectively a marriage. And now every 
transgression, every breaking of that covenant, is effectively adultery. They had played the harlot, he says. I'll read it again. For of all times I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bonds, and thou saidst, I will not serve. This is my people. Let my people go that they may serve me. And here they are in adamant defiance and abandonment of what their fathers had promised. They said, I will not serve. For upon every high hill and under every green tree, thou dost bow thyself playing the harlot. Now listen to God remembering. Yet I had planted thee a noble vine, holy a right seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate branches of a foreign vine unto me? For though thou wash thee with lye, that's a kind of a soapy thing, and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord. Can you see this? This is God in Jeremiah chapter 2 saying, you can't wash this out. Though you take you lye, though you take the normal things that you use to wash stains out of soap, your iniquity is marked before me. There's, there's, there's nothing that will remove this stain from their clothing. This is the picture of it. Thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord Jehovah. How canst I say, I am not defiled? I have not gone after the Balaam. See thy way in the valley. Know what thou hast done. And then, this is the reason I said that this was a kind of a, an earthy comparison. Thou art a swift dromedary, traversing her whales, a wild ass used to the wilderness that snuffeth up the wind in her desire. What's that a picture of? That's a picture of the female, of a, an ass, a donkey, um, and at the time of its season, in its time, it snuffs up the wind. It's smelling for the scents, the is it pheromones as they call them, for the male donkey. It is urgent for a union. And it goes on to say, Know what thou hast done, thou art a swift dromedary, traversing her ways, going all over the place, a wild ass used to the wilderness, that snuffs up the wind in her desire. And then God says this, in her occasion, in other words, in her time, in her season, who can turn her away? All they that seek her will not weary themselves. In her month they shall find her. When this passion takes hold of animal creatures, they are relentless and they develop all kinds of cunning wheezes to break out of nice safe gardens and to go and find a husband amongst the renegade curs of the neighbourhood. And Jeremiah here is using this powerful language. Remember, this is God's people who, who God said, Be holy, for I am holy. And now he's likening them to a wild ass absolutely out of cult control, driven by her passions, her desires. All they that seek her will not weary them. In her month, they shall find her. The nation was like a female donkey in heat. There was no stopping her. Now Jeremiah says, the condition is etched upon the nation's heart and it is incurable. It's against this background of a nation's nature that Jeremiah gives the amazing promise of a new covenant. We're not talking, we've said this frequently too, we're not now talking about individual transgressions against known prohibitions. We're not talking about the score of sins and this sin that is. We're talking about a nature, we're talking about an inward passion, we're talking about a driving dynamic which is thrusting the nation constantly into these ways that are abhorrent to God. It's breathtaking in its implications. This is nothing less, this new covenant is nothing less than the promise of a new nature. Not just sins washed away, that is wonderful. I remember 
the day I realized that God had taken my sins away, that I was forgiven, and I felt as though I was walking on air. It was a conscious experience that I can remember to this day. I can tell you, I can tell you to exactly the spot where that realization came to me. <laughs> That's wonderful. But I, Jeremiah is speaking here about something of a different order. He's now talking about the nature. Is it possible that the lust for other gods could be replaced by a lust for the true God? Maybe you know that the word lust in the New Testament is used of a strong passion, whether the passion is a good one or a bad one. When Jesus said, with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, he used the word that is often translated in the New Testament as lust. And when someone from a Hebrew mindset doubles up a word like lust like this, it intensifies it. You know this, the Holy of Holies, the Song of Songs, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. This means the ultimate. And here Jesus says, with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you. This was a passion in his heart. It was a, it was a heat in his heart. It was such a hunger in his heart. Is it possible that the lust for other gods could be replaced by a lust? I'll stick to the word. A lust, a passion, a flame for the true God. When Paul wrote of certain Old Testament accounts, records of things that had happened, he said that the things that had occurred were written for our admonition. This is a caution and reminder. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. He's speaking about the people of Israel and their disobedience in the very early days of their covenant in the wilderness. And then he says this. Now all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written so what was this recorded here is not the absolute total of all that ever happened to the people of Israel. But what we have recorded are things that happened that had lasting significance. These things that happened, they were written, they authentically happened. This is true history. But there's a lot of true history that doesn't find its way into the scriptures. But these were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. That, that's Paul saying that these events which have been recorded from the Old Testament were written for our admonition. God had us in mind and he preserved the record of these things because they have lasting significance in teaching us God's ways and our ways. The events were true in themselves, but they were recorded for a continuing purpose. The description of the house of Judah is not recorded because they were unique in their spiritual promiscuity, but because they serve as a template, a pattern for us all. The house of Judah is not exceptional. It's a description of the heart of every man and woman who has not as yet enjoyed the blessings of the new covenant. Prone to wonder. In the 18th century, an unhappy preacher, Robert Robinson, wrote a hymn that we often sing that begins, Come thou fount of every blessing. And it has a stanza that says, O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I am constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. He begins to speak of a consciousness that there is in him a wanderlust. There is in him something that seems to want to go after other things. And he says, only grace can deal with this. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I am constrained to be. Let thy goodness, thy God's faithful goodness and provision, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. And then he says this, listen to this for a testimony. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone. To leave the God I love. That proneness to wandering 
that proneness to leaving the God with whom they had entered into covenant was the typical experience of the people of the house of Israel and then of the house of Judah. Now this hymn has some fine sentiments, but perhaps there are some sub-Christian theme elements and themes here too. In his honesty, he describes his heart in terms that Jeremiah would have recognised and happily used to describe the house of Judah, prone to wander, Lord. I feel it prone to leave the God I love, a bias, a tendency, an inclination. That's an interesting word, isn't it? Incline something which takes a certain angle and is not upright. It sounds like Jeremiah's donkey sniffing up the wind in search of a mate. But listen, wait, listen to his prayer. Here's my heart, he says. O oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Now, is this proneness to wander and this incurable state, is that really forever? Or can God do something about our condition now on earth? Or must we wait for the courts above, as Robert Robinson referred to them? He is my heart, O Lord, and see it, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. It's almost as though he is, he wants God to do something and put his seal on things and stamp them. But he's really looking for his ultimate deliverance in heaven, in the courts above. Must we wait for the courts above? Or is this salvation a present possibility? Or must we await a heavenly fulfilment? When I call these elements sub-Christian, I'm not criticising Robert Robinson. I'm not saying that he was sub-Christian, but only that his experience of proneness to wander or proneness to leave the God I love, his expectation is sub-Christian. A wandering heart and proneness to turn our back on God are not to be regarded as the norm of Christian experience. I heard a world-famous preacher once, he was speaking, and he used this analogy, and he said, he was explaining how God, he felt, had led him to do certain things. He said, but I, he said, when I say God led me to do this, he said, I mean that if you look, you can see the grooves in the earth of my angle, my ankles, my feet, where God dragged me into his will. And it distressed me. I hope that I've never been any grooves in the earth. Testimonies to my reluctance to go in the way that God wanted me to go. This hymn expresses the feelings of many who call themselves Christians. It's not yet arrived at the great before and after statements of the New Covenant. It's missing the assurance of the but now, which keep coming through in the Scriptures. You were like this, but now. You were like this, but now. You did like this, but now. You behaved like this, but now. Listen to Peter here. These are well-known verses. But have you ever looked at them really carefully and seen what it is they're speaking about? He speaks of Christ and he says that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. He's got to tell you why. So that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. When? In heaven when we die? That's not what Peter's saying. He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Do you notice how he switches the pronoun? On his body, in the, he died, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, all of us, might live for righteousness, die to sins, live to righteousness, by whose stripes you, can you see his finger? Can you see my finger pointing? <laughs> by those by whose stripes you were healed. And then he makes this statement, and I want you to notice 
the tenses of the verbs. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Peter identifies our instinctive spiritual promiscuity, the lust for other things, that proneness to wander. And he says this to those who sought the blessings without the blessing. And he puts it into the past tense and he says, you used to be like sheep going astray. Hallelujah, there's a gleam of hope after a dark night. You were like sheep going astray, but have now, Peter's got it, the but now, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. Now, these wonderful verses have an incurable spiritual sickness in you, but in Peter's declaration, it's a historic sickness. It's not a current disease. It was Christ's death by his stripes which provided the cure. By his stripes we have been healed. Whose stripes have been healed? Those who are in him. Those who have come into this new covenant with him. That proneness to wander, prone to leave the God I love, was never part of the normal experience. One or two times in my life, I've often I had to move from maybe one thing I was doing to another person, that I, another thing that I was doing. And occasionally people have said it must have been very painful. Uh, did you resist it? And I, as far as I can recall, I've never resisted it. When I've become convinced of the will of God, no matter how impossible the circumstances seem, I've gone for it. I I have no recollection of ever digging in my heels and saying, I don't want to go this way. These wonderful verses have an incurable spiritual sickness in view. But in Peter's declaration, that's a historic sickness, not a current experience. So, let's just make a brief introduction of Jeremiah. Now, if Jeremiah is bold in the way that he illustrates what's going to take place with the new covenant when that comes into its time of power and effect, if Jeremiah is bold, then Ezekiel is more so. Ezekiel does not use the term new covenant, but it's plain that he has the same promises in mind when he issued his prophecies in Babylon itself. He's, he's about 20 years later than Jeremiah, but he's, uh, he's 1,500 miles away um, in a different, an entirely different country in a completely different context. But he has the same promises of God doing something radical, doing something different, doing something new. He doesn't use the language of God carving his own will into the hearts of men and women. Ezekiel's language is if anything, even more radical. He has the same themes of restoration, but his expression is even more breathtaking. Let me read to you Ezekiel 36, verse 25 following. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. That's wonderful, isn't it? Isn't that wonderful? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the first part of this speaks of sprinkling, a cleansing from all your filthiness, from all your idols. We have our idols too. Will I cleanse you? And then he says this, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. Can you see how he's, he, did, he doesn't know Jeremiah's writings, of course. Almost certainly he didn't know it. He may have heard little bits about it, but I doubt very much that away in Babylon he had had copies of Jeremiah's prophecies. But the same God is speaking the same truths into his heart and giving him 
slightly different pictures. He's speaking now first of a cleansing from all your filthiness, from all your idols. He knows what the ruling sin is in these people. I'll, you're, I'll cleanse you from all your idols. I'll cleanse you. But then instead of saying that he will inscribe his law upon the heart, he says, a new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my ways. And you shall keep my ordinances and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And you shall be my people. And I will be your God. There's that familiar chorus again. An exclusive relationship. You'll be mine and I will be yours. And he's addressing the same condition of spiritual promiscuity. And it concludes at the same point as Jeremiah in declaring that you shall be my people and I will be your God. Ezekiel, however, this is dangerous territory. Ezekiel, however, uses the language of replacement. And very specifically, too. The old heart, he says quite specifically, will be removed, not painted over, not um, just chiseled away, but the old heart will be removed and a new heart put in its place. I mean, let me remind you, a new heart also will he give you and a new spirit I'll put within you. And then if you say, how's he going to do that? He says, well, I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, that I will give you a heart of flesh. Yeah, for me, I can't help but hear an echo from the book of Hebrews. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. This new heart is not added to the old heart, so that these two hearts have to kind of scrap it out, depending on which you've fed most proficiently. The centre of his prophecy is... Not just cleansing, but here the old heart will be removed and a new heart put in its place. Ezekiel declares that God's purpose is both to cleanse and renew. The centre of his prophecy is that well, God will give them a new heart and a new spirit. Now Jeremiah's incurable condition has a remedy, a transplant. Of course, this was long before the possibility of physical heart transplants but the language is very precise the old stone heart the one which jeremiah said the nation's nature was written on is to be removed and replaced by a heart of flesh here the ideas of intractable stone and responsive flesh are being contrasted the prophecy is remarkable for its clarity of the process by which God would achieve his purposes. Yes, I know we're talking picture language, but it's picture language which God has chosen to convey truths to our hearts. Not only would a new heart be given, but the old heart would be taken away. He would give a new heart and put a new spirit at the innermost point. But more, now I'm back into Romans chapter 5, more, much more, but more, his own spirit would take up resident in the renewed nature. Let me read it again, in, in case you didn't pick these things up as I read it the first time. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. That's cleansing. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. That's what I'm talking about, replacement. He takes away the old that he may establish the new. So, where does this leave us? So, the replacement of the old heart and spirit with a new heart and spirit is a wonderful prize. But in itself, it may have a weakness. You see, it's not necessarily more secure if other things were not added, even a cleansed temple might well revert to its old state. As we've seen earlier, 
The physical temple of Christ's day was cleansed twice, once at the beginning and once at the end of his earthly ministry. In the space of three years, the cleansed temple had reverted to its original state of defilement. Reformation alone, replacement alone, has no power to maintain itself. There have been several reformations in the history of God's people, but the nation-states quickly reverted to their own ways. If replacement were the end of the matter, the human race might well find itself in a similar state or even worse. Do you remember this intriguing comment that Jesus spoke when he was speaking about the danger that faced the people of Israel in his day? He said this, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it goes through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. What would you call that? Cleansed? Then, this is the evil spirit, he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Oh, it is this kind of demonology theology that we need to give some attention to? Well, I'm not going to do it now, because this goes on to say, so shall it be with this wicked generation. In other words, what the Lord is saying, that in some measure, the people of Israel have responded to John the Baptist's ministry and to his ministry. And there has been an initial, you might almost say, superficial cleansing. There has been a reformation. There's been a new start. But within the three years, he's having to do the whole thing all over again. I remember a man who had a very special gift in discernment of spirits and a ministry that was a great help to many, many people. I remember him saying on one occasion, it's easy to chase the rats away, but if you don't clear up the sewer, they'll be back. This is what Jesus is saying about the nation. There had been a cleansing. There had been like Joshua, he had been bringing the land of Israel under his authority. He brought nature under his authority. He brought all kinds of things, evil spirits under his authority. It was the kingdom of God personalized in Jesus Christ. And Jesus gives this really frightening warning to the nation. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I'll return to my house from which I came. When he comes, he finds it empty, swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be with this wicked generation. There's uh, solemn warnings are given in the scriptures in the New Testament about dogs returning to their vomit, about going back to the things that they have been cleansed from, about becoming short-sighted and not realizing that God has cleansed us from our old sins. But in Jeremiah's prophecy, the prophecy is not only of taking away and replacing, but of God himself taking up residence in the cleansed temple. You see, the temple that Jesus cleansed was found empty and swept and put in order. God often sweeps and puts things in order. But if the temple is left empty, it is supremely vulnerable. He goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be also with this wicked generation. But Jeremiah's promise is not only of taking away and replacing, but of God himself taking up residence in the cleansed temple. 
Oh, this is wonderful. But I'm going to pause here. <laughs> and God willing, we'll continue this theme next time we meet together on Bible Bases, Broken Bread. And the next study in our series on the Better Covenant, Revisited. So thank you for being with us and, and, and joining us in these Bible studies. And we hope you'll come and join us again for the next one. Same place, same time. God willing, next week. God bless you.